Hello, my darlings. Welcome to today's episode of The Roman World, wherein we're going to be talking about changing concepts of masculinity as viewed through the poetry of Gaius Valerius Catullus. Now, I've cherry-picked from Catullus's many poems. Uh, before we go into this too much, though, we need to talk about how nifty it is that we have Catullus at all. Catullus was lost for centuries until finally somebody rummaging around in the basement of the Vatican found underneath a wine barrel this um, fragmented, uh, moth-eaten, well, probably bookworm-eaten bit of uh, vellum. And when they looked at it, they realized that what they had was the lost poet Catullus. So we have Catullus just by the skin of our teeth. There's only one manuscript that survives, and every edition we have of Catullus is made off of careful, careful uh, consideration and editing from that manuscript. So if we didn't have this, we'd be missing a, a giant window that lets us look into people who are pushing back a little bit on the gendered expectations of their age, but also people who were interested in creating Latin versions of Greek literature who just want to complain about their lives and use poetry as a vehicle for doing this. Catullus is fantastic, and if you get the chance, reading him in Latin is a real pleasure and a joy. But this isn't a class where we read him in Latin. If you're interested, though, we do offer such a class. Uh, Latin one, or sorry, 201, which I usually teach, so stay tuned. But today we're going to use Catullus in translation to get at a question that may have been sitting with you as we were talking about gender norms, rules, the Roman family. Um, we got at this a bit when we were talking about Plautus too. In a society that has so many very harsh standards for what is good and normative masculinity and what is not. Standards that often prioritize violence and antisocial behavior. How then did real people react to this? You know, was every Roman man living by this code of uh, subsuming your personal life and ambitions to the demands of your pater familias, to your state? Well, the answer is no, not everybody was doing this, and some people were actively working to create a new kind of masculinity, and Catullus is one of these people. Now, I don't want to give you unreasonable expectations, right? This is still the first century BCE, and while some norms are being questioned, other norms are being leaned into, so if you're looking for... Um, wholesomeness, Catullus isn't the place to go for that. Another warning, if you're listening with small children underfoot, we're going to be talking pretty frankly about Roman sexual vocabulary and Roman curse words. These I'm going to explain in clinical detail, which means I'm going to have to use some um, less than PG words here. So brace yourself, I'll try to make it clear when I'm about to do that. But it's important because without that, we get this impression of Romans as being these um, proper upright folks who are always behaving nobly. In fact, you get some people who treat Romans like this, especially in the 1700s. Our country was founded by some Rome fanboys who were super invested in this idea of Romans being noble and good and upright and virtuous and so on and so forth. Uh, first, that's not what weirtus means, as we've talked about earlier, right? Weirtus doesn't mean um, self-sacrificing behavior or uh, heroism in the sense that a firefighter is heroic. Weirtus just means manliness, manliness in service of the state. <sighs> yeah, so, so Catullus, he's going to use some language. But if you've ever want to learn how to cuss in Latin, this is going to be your lecture, because Latin words sound super fine and fancy, and it's a really good way to um, vent your frustrations with family who maybe don't like English curse words. 
So here we go. Now we're going to meet Catullus. Yay! We are fairly sure about his birth and death dates. Uh, 84 BCE or thereabouts to 54 BCE. He dies pretty young yeah, in his 30s. Just sad. Um, before we go too far into his life story, though, we need to talk a bit about the difference between poetry and autobiography because it's going to be really tempting to use the details from Catullus's poem to try to build a timeline of his life and to figure out you know, who his real girlfriend was, who his boyfriend was, um, at what point in Caesar's career he's writing anti-Caesar poetry. This is difficult though because poetry is a kind of art where you are engaging with earlier authors' works, where you're taking conventions of the genre, you're maybe using a little bit of your life to inspire that, but in order to create the illusion that you're expressing genuine emotion, uh, sometimes you invent details, you tweak them a little bit, as you guys are already familiar. For instance, uh, the actual life of Taylor Swift isn't going to look exactly like the lyrics of Taylor Swift, right? Or say, just because an artist writes about how her spouse was cheating with a lady named Becky, whose hair was fantastic for some reason, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that Mr. Spouse is cheating with Becky. Doesn't mean Spouse wasn't cheating with Becky either. Um, Similarly, an artist can claim to have a pool full of liquor deep enough to dive into, but this does not mean that they literally have a pool full of liquor deep enough to dive into, or like they're regularly lighting their cigars with $100 bills, although maybe they are, because famous people are nuts. All of this is to say that just because Catullus claims that events fell out in a certain way in his poetry, this doesn't mean that's historical evidence. And that's going to be our real problem when we try to figure out what's going on with Catullus's poetry. So we're going to be really tempted to think that there's confessional, uh, personal detail happening here, and there might be. But over the years, scholars have noticed that Catullus pulls on earlier poetry, sometimes in very close detail. He's inspired by Greek lyric poetry, so much so that some of his poems are translations of known Greek archaic uh, poetry. For instance, one of the ones we're going to look at here is a Latin translation of an original written by the poet Sappho from the island of Lesbos. Uh, Sappho is one of several female poets. She was very well respected, highly regarded. So creating a Latin version of Sappho, it doesn't mean he's copying, translating his art, but because we have the original poem, we can also tell that the first few bits are pretty close to what Sappho's Greek is, but the last stanza is entirely new. The Catullus isn't just a translator but he's writing for an audience who's familiar with Greek lyric poetry, and there are a lot of inside jokes that you only get if you have that knowledge. Now, I'm not going to make you run out and read a bunch of Greek lyric poetry, too, but where it's relevant, I'm going to talk about it a little bit here. He was born in Verona. I've got Verona on the map for you there in the Po River Valley in what was then called Cis Alpine Gaul. Cis means on the same side of uh, the Alps as Rome is versus Trans Alpine Gaul, which is Trans the Alps. Uh, that's what we generally just call Gaul. But it's important to remember that Celtic peoples were living inside of Italy and were closer to Rome than you might think. This means also that Catullus is from one of this first generation of people to take advantage of the new citizen rights that had been extended to the Italian countryside in the wake of the social wars. You recall 
Before the social wars, some Italian towns had preferred status with the city of Rome, some did not, and this unequal access to voting rights and other citizen rights in the city of Rome proper led to a war wherein the Italian allies demanded that they all get citizen rights. They lose this war, Rome wins, but then they get their rights anyway, so they also win. Everybody wins in the social wars, except for the dead people. I don't think they win. Now, before this point, those towns that did have full citizen rights had been sending their most educated and wealthy citizens to Rome for a political career. In fact, some familiar faces that you think of as Roman are from Italian countryside. Uh, countryside towns, not from the city of Rome proper. In fact, the only surviving author we have who's a native to the city of Rome is Julius Caesar. Livy, not from Rome. A Cato the Elder, right? Cato the freaking Elder, Mr. Rome for Romans, Cato the Elder. He's from the city of Tusculum, not Rome. Um, now, Catullus is a citizen of Verona, likely and this this bit of biographical detail is pretty clear he was one of these first waves of upper class citizens to be sent to rome for education and in the hopes that he would pursue a military and political career so as to climb the ladder in the cursus honorum eventually become consul and then become a powerful roman in his own right this is what cato the elder did uh, this is what Cicero did in more recent memory. Cicero is a little bit older than Catullus. Uh, Cicero is born in 105 BCE, I think, so he's about a generation older than Catullus. He, uh, Gaius Marius, oh gosh, why am I not mentioning Gaius Marius? We just learned about him, yeah. He's from Arpinum, the same town as uh, Cicero is from, and much like Cicero, he moves to the city of Rome, he has a military career, and this lets him eventually get to be a military dictator. Nice work if you can get it. So Catullus's parents are likely hoping that Catullus will do this too, and they're sacrificing just enough money that Catullus can be in the city where everything's happening. And this is much on Catullus's mind as he's dealing with power structures and writing poetry in this context. Uh, Catullus must have experienced a huge amount of pressure to live up to this ideal of Roman masculinity. And like most of the people who aspired to this ideal, he's not going to be successful if you count success as being Marius or being Cato the Elder, right? He never has a very large estate. Apparently he he does have a country house, but it's not very big. He does a lot of humble bragging about his tiny country house. Similarly, he never gets to be consul. We don't know if he had political office ever. He talks a little bit about his military career, which he found very um, frustrating for reasons we'll unpack in a minute. He, as the voice of his generation, is speaking for the majority of upwardly mobile young men moving to Rome during the first century BCE. Often your reward for trying to get ahead was to end up fighting in a civil war or dying in a civil war or eking out this existence where you have to spend money to get into the patronage game, but you don't necessarily have the kind of capital that your peers do. And poverty in this context creates barrier, barriers to social inclusion, social inequality, um, frustration, and also deep-seated feelings of guilt when you aren't able to achieve the Roman dream. This is the part of Catullus that I find really relatable, yeah, because we still live in a world where you're pressured to expend more money than you have on hand to get an education, and then you expend still more money moving to cities trying to get a good job, and then this piles up and piles up until you're trying to raise your children while paying off student loans while trying to get a job that gives you sick leave, right? I mean, this is still relatable, and we do a lot of things as investments in our future careers that 
may not necessarily give us a future career. And dealing with that anxiety, with that pressure, with that feeling of failure and embarrassment is something that Catullus' poetry uh, sits with for a while. And if you enjoy him for nothing else, feeling validated by an ancient Roman who is also super cheesed off at economic inequality uh, might be helpful to you. So if you're feeling poor, read on. Catullus is here to help you feel validated. He talks about his friends and the caveat part of us should make us stop for a minute, yeah, because of course your poetry is an autobiography, except a lot of the names that he mentions are known upper class Roman names. For instance, Cinna, who is another poet. Uh, if you've read um, Jul or William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, you may remember Cinna the poet. He had a cousin, Cinna the assassin, who killed Julius Caesar. Cinna the poet ends up murdered on the street in a case of mistaken identity where people think that, oh, you're Cinna the assassin. He's like, no, I'm Cinna the poet. And they're like, stabby, stabby, stabby. And he dies anyway. Uh, poor Cinna, but he's not dead yet. He's alive in Catullus's poetry, so you'll get to meet him briefly. Uh, also, Licinius Calvus is another one of Catullus's friends. It's likely that they were part of the same po poetic circle. Artists in ancient Rome used to join informal or slightly more formal poetry circles where they would share their first drafts, they'd work on their craft together. These were often sponsored by a patron, and your patron would both pay you some money to focus on your poetry career and then promote you when your books came out. Roman poetry is meant to be performed out loud, so we're encountering Catullus in one of the more artificial ways you can encounter him. While it was written down so it could be shared, you weren't expected to just sit and read it to yourself. When you got a scroll of poetry, you were expected to perform it as well. It's a little bit like sheet music. Yeah, you don't buy sheet music to sit down and read the sheet music off the sheet music. You use it so that you can play a version of it and enjoy the art. That's what ancient liter all ancient literature was aiming to do, including prose, but poetry specifically was meant to be performed and to be enjoyed as a performance. So imagine these poems not just as a written down thing, but something Catullus would have gotten up and performed with gestures and hand motions and an audience that was reacting to it um, like a I don't know, poetry slam. It's what we're going for. I've put a couple of the other friends that he mentions, uh, Hortensius, Cornelius, Napos. Uh, these are other known poets that seem to have been part of Catullus's circle. This is one of several circles, and these circles tended to be competitive circles, often based around political affiliation. Catullus seems to have been part of a We Hate Caesar poetry circle. There was also a pro-Caesar poetry circle. Eventually, Augustus found uh, the future emperor Augustus, Caesar's nephew and successor, has his own circle that's run by his bro, a dude named Mycenas. Eventually, politicians kind of glom onto this idea of getting poets who work for you to make you look good in the art scene. But uh, Catullus isn't one of these. Now, this is not to say Catullus never sold out. He probably sold out somebody because we all do. Unless you guys have managed to not sell out, in which case more power to you. Um, yeah, I'm not teaching you guys for free. I love you though. I really love my job. And this is the other thing is just because you have sponsorship, it doesn't mean you're a bad artist or that your art is invalid or unhelpful. Uh, we got to eat. We live in the world we live in until we figure out an economic system that does not force people to do shit to get money to eat. Sponsorship is going to be a thing. So on, uh, let's see, what else did I want to see? Um, Caesar and Catullus. Yes, I've talked about that. Uh, Catullus, not a fan. He's also contemporary with the rise of Caesar to prominence. We're going to talk about Caesar a bit more in the next lecture, but in case you're not familiar, Julius Caesar is 
the Roman that you're most likely to have heard of before. He's a military dictator and a part of an unofficial cabal of three Roman politicians who conspired to ram their legislative agenda through the Roman Senate and the Roman People's Assembly. Now, this legislative agenda was kind of progressive to a point. This was a reaction to the legislative agenda of Sulla. You'll remember Sulla from the last lecture, right? After Marius, Sulla instituted a regime that was all about putting back together the powers of the hereditary elites and keeping power concentrated in the senatorial class's hands. But like most political pol pendulums, this swings back the other way. Now, this may be tempting as um, a time to look at as a positive moment for Roman history. And for some people it was. A lot of this legislation did provide relief to the unemployed, uh, paths to jobs and power access for the least enfranchised. It was part of a package that gave land to retired soldiers. So it was a, a good time for veterans to a point. It was also a bad time for veterans because civil wars are a great way to die a lot. But it, there's a dark side to this legislation as well. Because Caesar's not doing this just because he really likes poor people and is concerned about access to power. He realizes, as many politicians do in the late Republic, that although you need to get fewer hearts and minds if you're playing to the powerful elite, if the powerful elite aren't going to let you in their treehouse, a way around them is by getting lots and lots of people from the lower classes to support you. And Sulla had made a lot of enemies because part of how he got to be a military dictator, remember, was the prescription lists. He made a list of his enemies, declared them enemies of the state, and then made it legal, not just legal, but he paid a bounty to anybody who went out and killed them and brought the head back. This meant that an entire generation of Romans had been systematically slaughtered for pay by allies of Sulla. This meant Sulla had a lot of enemies left standing because you can't kill everyone, yeah? So in that formative moment, Caesar comes to power. Now, Caesar is Sulla's nephew, but he's also Marius's, um, Marius's nephew too because Marius and Sulla were married to two sisters, uh, Julia and Julia. Their brother Julius was Julius Caesar's dad. And this is partly why Caesar's left alive because he's related to Marius, but he's also related to Sulla. So Sulla just takes his property away and calls it good. His comeback career then takes a very Marius-shaped trajectory. He, Caesar doesn't have any money because Sulla took it all. So he rises through the ranks. He's a military genius, and he's able to gain a real following from the legions. And then he also bat, borrows a lot of money and then uses this to get in good with people who are already powerful in Rome, but who don't get along with each other. That's Pompey and Crassus. More of this story is coming. In the year 60 BCE, so this is, um, what, uh, 11, 12 years before Catullus dies, Caesar is consul, and he uses this to pass legislation in a way that is technically illegal. And it's a lot of legislation for redistribution of property. And part of how he does this is that everybody who is pro-Caesar gets kickbacks. Um, Caesar is both a politician, but also a bit of a classic mob boss kind of dude. If you're not in his friend circle, you are not getting the kickbacks. And why I'm telling you all of this in this lecture is that Catullus's protest poetry doesn't make a lot of sense unless you know all of this. One other thing we need to talk about with the temptation to treat Catullus's biography has to do with his most frequent addressee in his love poetry, that is a woman he calls Lesbia. This is a 
An example of a frequent strategy that poets have for writing poetry to a person, but not wanting to identify that person by their actual name. Um, Becky from uh, Beyonce is probably a good test case here. Like uh, Becky probably isn't her actual name. We change the name so that people can't go Google Becky, but also immediately everybody tries to figure out who the heck Becky is. This situation exists with Lesbia. So Lesbia is a made up name. It's just the feminine form of Lesbios, which means a person from the island of Lesbos. It's a compliment. It's linking Catullus's girlfriend with the poet Sappho, whose hometown is Lesbos, the island of Lesbos. Um, this is also why lesbians are called lesbians, because a lot of Sappho's poetry is by her written to women in a romantic way. Uh, it gives us the word lesbian, but lesbian also means just person from the island of Lesbos, which is what Catullus is going for here, here is he's not commenting on her sexual orientation. Uh, Romans thought of sexual and romantic orientations differently than we do more about that coming up. Now, people have been trying to figure out if there was a real lesbia, and if so, who she was for a while. One popular theory that you may see bandied about got to be current in the Middle Ages, which identified lesbia with um, a Roman noblewoman in the first century BCE, a contemporary with Catullus and Cicero named Clodia Metelli, or just Clodia. She was from the Clodius Polcare branch of the Claudii. This is a family that's eventually going to end up being one of the two royal families in charge of the early empire. Um, more about her brother Clodius Polcare in a bit. They were a firebrand family who were very supportive of um, anti-wealthy, anti-establishment legislati leg legislative agendas, including the abolishment of debt. This is going to be something we'll talk about a little bit more later. But what you need to know for now is that the family, because of this political stance, of this very popularizing stance, um, especially since they're from one of the oldest patrician families in Rome. The Claudii are just as old as the Juliuses, if not even older. This is the bluest of blue blood, and so it was considered a huge betrayal when they go over to this popularizing anti-rich trend in policy. Like many women in the late Republic, Clodia was increasingly politically active, but through her household machinations. She married three times. Each of these spouses were influential politicians on the popular side of the aisle, uh, beginning with, um, oh, what's the first one? Uh, Masala, I think. Um, I'm not remembering the, uh, dang it, I'll have to look this up later, uh, but at any rate, she made a variety of marriages. She was close with other politically active women at the time, including Fulvia, uh, who, among other spouses, was married to Marcus Antonius for a while. And she was an outspoken critic of the old establishment bureaucracy. So much so that eventually she ends up embroiled in a political scandal wherein she takes one of her lovers to court, uh, a guy named, um, oh goodness, what's his name? Um, Caelius, uh, Caelius Rufus, who's one of Catullus's friends, incidentally. Uh, he, she accuses him of trying to poison her, and then he gets the best lawyer in Rome, a guy named Cicero more about Cicero later, who essentially slut shames Clodia until the, the jury convicts Caelius of poisoning. Uh, this tends to suggest to me that Caelius did indeed try to poison her and she fought back. More power her. But because she left this um, indelible impression on history, 
for being just so unusually active and high profile and outspoken. When people were trying to find women of the late Republic who possibly would have dated Catullus, this is one of the first ones they reach for. Uh, she was known to have had boyfriends who weren't her husbands, which is one of the bits of evidence you'll sometimes see put in the mix here. She was also a patroness of the arts. She was highly educated and really active in the uh, arts social scene of Rome and the Republic. And finally, her name scans the same in poetic meter as does Lesbia. So Lesbia is a long short short, Lesbia. And then Claudia is also a long short short, Claudia. So you could take all of Catullus's poems with Lesbia in them, put Claudia instead, and they'd still scan like poetry. Now, if this is sounding a little weak as evidence to you, well, it is, it's weak. And there is no way to tell. Maybe we're talking about the same person, maybe we're not talking about the same person. Um, Oh, I'm forgetting one of the big bits of evidence. I mentioned that Caelius Rufus, the man that Lesbia takes to court for trying to kill her, was one of Catullus's friends. We know this because Catullus writes him poetry, uh, some of which is, oh my God, dude, you stole my girlfriend. And other bits are like, yeah, she dumped you too. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, she did. Which I think is the more one of the more compelling bits of evidence. Another poem Catullus writes alleges that Claudia is way too close to her brother, or sorry, that Lesbia is way too close to her brother Lesbius. And one of the scandals that Claudia got involved in was because she was very close to her brother, people accused them of being boyfriend and girlfriend. And their names are very similar, Claudia, Clodius, but like any Roman woman, her brother's name is going to be her name with an us on the end of it. So it's not a smoking gun here, but I feel like I need to tell you that this theory exists because it's going to come up if you try to Google any of this. All right, on to the poetry. I'm going to start at Catullus 79 because this here is the poem that you're going to see cited as the smoking gun evidence that Clodia is the same person as Lesbia. So how does this poem go? Let's see. Lesbius is pretty. Why not? Since Lesbia likes him more than you and all your people, Catullus. But Still, let this pretty boy sell Catullus and all his people if he should find three people to acknowledge his birth. Now, in order to figure out what's going on, you've got to look at the Latin, which is why I've given it to you here. The words that I've highlighted in red, pulcare, is the Latin word for pretty, but it's also Clodia's brother's cognomen. His name was Publius Clodius Pulcare. We've met members of this family before. Publius Clodius, the chicken tosser, he was a polecare. The um, older guy who was working with Tiberius Gracchus, I think that's this Clodius's father, grandfather. So this particular Clo Clodius with the cognomen and polecare could be um, called out here. So Lesbius est polecare is going to scan the same as Clodius est polecare. So if you want to go with the hypothesis that Lesbia is Clodia, this is the best evidence you're going to get. Uh, I've also highlighted at the bottom the, the stinger in this epigram. This is meant to be a devastating takeout poem where <sighs> Catullus is basically saying, you know, yeah, he's pretty, but good luck if you can find three people who are going to acknowledge that he's legitimate. The The word suavia in Latin literally means like a hello kiss. I mentioned earlier that Romans, when they said hello to each other, they shook hands just like we do. They also regularly would kiss each other three times on the cheek as a way of saying hi if you knew each other pretty well. And that's the tria suavia here that you give to somebody who's like your real legitimate friend. And this is something that you may be familiar with 
without realizing that you're familiar with it from the New Testament. In the stories about how Jesus's last days went down, when Judas tells the, the Romans who are arresting Jesus which one is Jesus, he does it by going up to him and kissing him on the cheek because that would have been considered like a normal casual thing you do to show that this is your BFF. Uh, kissing wasn't necessarily sexualized in the ancient world in the way it is today, or you know, France still does it this way. Don't do it now, though. Social distancing is important, but like air kisses are probably all right if you do them over Skype. That's all I'm going to say about this particular fan theory. Um, I don't think it's a theory without merit, but it is a theory that we're going to have to be really careful about, especially if we use it as evidence for Clodia, her life, uh, what she was really like. Because when we do that, uh, it tends to go to a very judgmental place with a bit of a double standard for women's sexual behavior. So approach with caution is all I say there. All right, this brings us to Catullus X, his poem about coming back from his service in Bithynia. As an upwardly mobile young Roman man, Catullus, like his peers, joined the military as an officer, and he was excited to be sent on a gig with a provincial governor to the province of Bithynia. Bithynia is a wealthy province. It's been settled for a long time, old cities. It's right on the trade routes for both opium and gold and silver. So anybody going to Bithynia could expect to get some really fancy nice stuff. This is also part of the reward system that had by now become entrenched in Roman political office seeking. Because in order to run for office, you'd spend a lot of money. Even if you had money to begin with, you were going to run up a significant amount of debt between hosting people, having dinner parties, paying for campaign perks. Um, people would regularly buy their supporters bowls of grain, and then the bowls would be stamped with, uh, brought to you by Clodius for office. Clodius, a vote for Clodius is a vote for reform. So that's a situation that led to people being in a, a massive amount of debt by the time they get to the upper end of Roman office seeking. And not uncoincidentally, un the way that provincial govern governorships were staffed was by taking people the year after they had served in an office with imperium, either praetor or consul, and then sending them to govern one of Rome's shiny new provinces. While there, one of their main duty, duties was to collect tribute from the locals. The way they would do this, because it wasn't considered dignified for someone of senatorial class to deal with money farming, they'd hire a contractor who would then subcontract to local people to gather tax revenue. And if you collected more revenue than you had estimated you would be giving the government at the end of your year, you could keep the difference. And if this sounds like a recipe for absolute disaster, you're not wrong. What this meant is that Romans were incentivized to estimate their amount of taxes low and then collect the highest amount possible. Partly why contractors would hire locals is that local people knew where their neighbors kept the extra loot. They knew about the extra pig in your backyard or the gold you had stashed under the pillow. They'd tell the Romans, the Romans would come by, take your stuff and send it off to the governor's staff. Now, governors themselves regularly would give kickbacks to their staffers, a lot of them upwardly mobile young Roman men. So part of how Roman men were incentivized to join these military staffs is that this is how you'd make some of your first campaign money that you would then take back to Rome and use to build your career. When Catullus goes to Bithynia then, he's expecting that his provincial governor is going to try to beat extra taxes out of the locals and that those extras are going to kick back to him. Interestingly, none of this was legal. 
Roman provincial governors were not allowed to plunder the provinces. They regularly did, though, and so it was much to the surprise of one Gaius Verres when he found himself under prosecution for doing what everybody else did and stealing stuff from Sicily. Because the prosecuting attorney was Cicero, we have the speech preserved. Apparently, Verres would go around to temples with works of art, as they're called statues, and take the statues out of the temple ship them back to Rome and have them set up in his house and his gardens. Uh, he would shake down local wealthy people for money and for free dinners. And in one case, somebody had a pretty daughter that he tried to get into bed. It was uh, pretty egregious. And this seems to have been typical of Roman governors. And it is for this reason, in case you've ever wondered, uh, when people in the first century thought of the worst human beings they could think of, they first went to tax collectors. If you're familiar with the New Testament, you may have wondered why people hate the IRS so much. It's because tax collectors are neighbors who are collaborating with the occupational forces of Romans in your homeland, forces who have taken your country by armed might, and who are currently shaking you down for money every year on the year, and then moving all of that money back to the center of the empire, thus denuding you of your profits, your income, your spare chicken. Uh, it, and it happens because one of your neighbors sold out to the Romans so his stuff wouldn't get stolen. So this, this is why Romans were felt to be, or not Romans, tax collectors were felt to be the worst. The other thing that's going on here is we're using some of those Roman cuss words I told you we'd talk about, and here's a big one, irumator. In order to explain to you what an irumator praetor is, I need to explain to you how Roman sexuality worked. Because sexuality, that is, the way that we think about and categorize our sexual desires, needs, appetites, the way we think about some sexual behaviors as good and some sexual behaviors as stigmatized, all of this is the way we imagine sexuality. And this changes depending on culture. For instance, there's no Greek or Roman word for gay because they don't have a concept that matches one-on-one -on -one to our idea of a person who is attracted to a gender identity that is the same as their own. That just isn't how they're talking about it. This doesn't mean that there aren't people in the ancient world acting like we would now describe gay people. Totally there are because that's part of how humans do. But they use different ways to describe sexual desire and sexually licit and illicit activity. And this all revolved around their ideas of power structures being reinforced or being subverted. So to an ancient Roman man, your permissible sexual activity is with people whose bodies you own access to. So this would be your spouse, people that you own, your enslaved people, um, not technically your freed people, although that was considered somewhat permissible. The people you were not supposed to be having sex with are people who are more powerful than you, um, so much so that it was felt to be a real problem when women had relationships, uh, even marriages, with men who were more power, sorry, less powerful than they were. At one point, they tried to put a ban on Roman women marrying freedmen, and Roman women just keep on doing it because love finds a way, doesn't it? Now, they felt that it was inappropriate for someone who was more powerful to be on the receiving end of a sexual act. Uh, in other words, they thought of the act of penetration, of putting a penis into somebody else, that the more powerful person was the person putting in and the less powerful person must be the receptive party, the, the person who is catching. And here I'm going to use pitcher and catcher to help 
deal with the awkwardness. So uh, if you're not familiar, the internet will tell you. Now, within this idea that more powerful people must always pitch, there are some caveats. For instance, even if you are the pitcher, you're not supposed to be pitching into your equal's wife because, uh, like we talked about with adultery legislation, adultery is felt to be a crime against the men involved with the the female party as just a um, middle middle person. So for that reason, even though your political rival's wife is technically less powerful than you because she's a woman, uh, it's a little bit like putting your penis into your political rival because the wife is an extension of the husband and therefore that's felt to be transgressive. And this is also why there's so much shame on men whose wives are having affairs. It's not just about blaming them for not having complete control, but it's also by implication you have let yourself be penetrated, and that's considered shameful and awful. This is also the reason why you don't see mainstream acceptance of same-sex marriages for men in the ancient world. Now, this isn't because people aren't doing it anyway, it's just the law never recognizes this, because it was felt to be inappropriate for adult men of the same age and social status to have one of them be the penetrator and the other the penetratee. They felt that that couldn't happen without somebody losing face. It was thought to be acceptable and permissible for an older man to be pitching while an adolescent man was catching. And in some cases, younger people still than that, uh, there's not great protections on children in sex trafficking, uh, but it was considered more respectable if you wait until their adolescence. But because you're not adolescent forever, that's a stage you grow out of. They felt that even if the relationship starts with an older man and a younger man, the younger man is eventually going to grow up and then they're going to be social equals. And like, how can that marriage work would be the ancient logic there. So for this reason, men who did quasi marry each other in the ancient world uh, were considered deviant, but it's not because of the homoerotic component per se. It's because of this penetrator, penetratee model of sexuality. Um, interestingly, this is why it was thought to be deviant to do certain sexual acts with women, even women who are your wife. For instance, if the woman is on top, she's not really catching. It's a little bit like she's pitching and that was felt to be like kinky and uh, naughty. And so this was something that men would regularly pay for on the sex market because interestingly, just because something is a taboo doesn't mean people don't want to do it. Sometimes it makes them want to do it even more. Uh, we also find men paying to give oral sex to women because that was felt to be uh, completely the opposite of the way things should happen, right? You, you sh They felt like that was a way that women are penetrating men, and that's like, oh gosh, we can't have that. So uh, Romans would be very confused that we're in a society now that by and large thinks it's okay and even laudable and permissible for a male spouse to give a female spouse oral sex. It's really necessary that I say all of this because you need to have this grid in mind when we're talking about words like irumator. So irumator comes from a verb that means to stick your penis into somebody else's mouth. Uh, I've translated it loosely as motherfucker because that gives you the idea of shock value this would have had to Romans. It's a really, really bad insult, and it's not the kind of word that you should be throwing around if you ever go to ancient Rome because somebody will get mad at you. But it doesn't have an idea of necessarily powerlessness either. This is a punching up word because this is a word you use for somebody who is um, 
screwing you over perhaps might be another way of saying this. This is somebody who is inappropriately shoving his penis into your mouth and you don't like it and it's an unhappy thing. And this is the way that less powerful people complained about more powerful people taking advantage of that power, is by calling them an irumator. Uh, maybe a closer translation for this is uh, skull fucker, possibly? Mm, I don't know. I wasn't that cool in high school. I sort of missed out on the cuss word thing. At any rate. That's important to realize because what Catullus is complaining about here is not just that he has a bad boss, but that he went to the trouble of signing up for the military. He's on a governor's staff. He travels all the way to Bithynia, leaving his friends in Rome goodbye for a year. And he does this because he expects that his governor is going to give him kickbacks, he's going to be wealthy, he's going to come home, and he's going to be the man. And clearly, that's what his friends are expecting from him, yeah? He runs into his friends that he hasn't seen in a year, and one of the first things they ask him is like, oh, dude, you went to Bithynia, what did you get? Now, Catullus is upset, not because his provincial governor is a horrible manipulative dirtbag, but rather his governor did not give him kickbacks. His governor did not share in any of his spoils. And for this reason, Catullus calls him an irumator, um, which may seem a little um, counterintuitive. I mean, his governor was deliberately not putting anything in his mouth, but cuss word logic doesn't really apply here. Okay, so here is the poem, which will, I will now read for you dramatically while interposing some commentary so you understand what's going on here. My Varus led me at leisure from the forum to see his girlfriend, little whore, as it was then seen by me immediately. She's not very uncharming, neither is she unattractive. As we came there, several conversations fell upon us, among which what now Bithynia was, how it was holding itself, and with what money it had profited me. So in other words, he runs across his dude friend Varus, and Varus's girlfriend, who is, I paraphrase here, uh, she's a slut, but my gosh, she's hot. Catullus. And then the first thing they ask him is like, hey, how's Bithynia? Where's your stuff? So let's see, where is Catullus' stuff? I told her what's true. Nothing at all. While neither the praetors nor their aides return any the richer, especially since our praetor, Memmius, the bugger, cared not a jot for his fellows. That's a uh, bugger is irumator here. But surely, they said, you could have bought slaves, they say, or made for the litter there. I, so the girl might take me to be wealthy, said, no, for me things weren't so bad that coming across one bad province, I couldn't buy eight good men. But I'd no one, neither here nor there, who might even raise his shoulder to the shattered foot of an old couch. At this, she, like the shameless thing she was, said, I beg you, my dear Catullus, for the loan of them, just for a while, I'd like to be carried to Serapis's temple. <laughs> Wait, I said to the girl. What I just said was mine and it isn't actually in my possession. My friend Cinna, that's Gaius, purchased the thing for himself. Whether they're his or mine, what difference to me? I use them just as well as if I'd bought them myself. But you are quite tasteless and annoying with whom no exact inexactness is allowed. Okay, so just to spell out what's going on in here. Um, first, Catullus is using a literary device called an unreliable narrator. So part of what's meant to be funny about this is we're meant to notice that Catullus, the narrator, just got caught in a lie and was made to look like an idiot and is dealing with the fact that somebody noticed that he was lying by calling him out on it. So this is not meant to be funny because he's using sexist language for his best friend's girlfriend, yeah. The reason that he's calling her a whore is not because she's a literal whore or indeed because the poem is about how awful she is. Oh no, she's a person who just noticed that Catullus was lying, exposed the lie, and he's mad. But part of why he's mad is that 
he's bought into this imperial system, right? He went to Bithynia, he thought he was going to get stuff, and now he has to go back to his friends and be like, uh, yeah, on my study abroad, I, I didn't get anything, and actually I didn't even get, like, academic credits or beer, so it was, that's the idea that we're going with here. So part of the joke is Catullus, but also Catullus is giving voice to what must have been the case for a generation of Roman men where they go into foreign service, they get themselves onto a governor's staff, they put up with that governor for a year, hoping that they're going to get some illegal kickbacks, and then they don't get the kickbacks, and then they're really upset about it. Part of what Catullus is doing here is making it acceptable to complain about how gosh darn unfair the older generation is being to him. So there's a little bit of okay boomer flavor going on in here. But also, he's dealing with a kind of embarrassment that I think we've all experienced, even if we haven't been relying on kickbacks from the provinces. That is, when we try to make ourselves look cooler than we actually are, and then somebody points out that we're lying, I, I, unless you guys are much more secure than I am, this is something that happens. You, you want people to think you're hip. They want you to they want your rather you want them to admire you and your stuff and your style and sometimes you exaggerate sometimes you embroider the facts uh, sometimes you pretend to be your friend and then when somebody asks a follow-up question that exposes you it's upsetting and you tend to displace that rage onto the person rather than own up to the fact that you've just been exposed as a liar so this poem is remarkable in that it's a Roman man displaying his insecurity, right? Nobody would know that this had happened, if it happened, if Catullus hadn't written this poem. But Catullus is writing this poem to an audience that he expects to relate to it, right? He expects his audience to be like, oh my gosh, that happened to me when I bragged about getting money from my provincial governorship. <laughs> it's meant to make it okay to talk about not getting the benefits from empire that you're hoping to get and uh, perhaps also sympathizing with a generation of Romans who are dissatisfied with their imperialism experience. On to our next one then. Speaking of the imperial experience, we're on to what appears to be a love poem though a love poem about people who are not the poet. This is a couple named Septimius and Acme, and what we see here at first may not look too risky. In fact, it's kind of like saccharine and sweet when you just read the poem. There's Septimius, and he's like, oh my god, Acme, I love you, you're my baby. And then Acme's like, oh, Septimius, you're awesome, I love you so much. And then they both kissy-kissy, and that's the end of the poem. Yes, it, on that level, this is a super irritating poem. But there's something interesting and naughty going on here in that Septimius is a Roman name, Acme is a Greek name. So here we're talking about a cross culture couple, one of whom is a Roman, uh, a Roman man, and the other has a Greek name. Uh, it's a female Greek name, Acme, that's a long eta on the end. And she may or may not be a free woman. This could be an enslaved person with whom he's having this relationship. And the way they're talking about their love, too, is really subversive. So, for instance, uh, the bits that I've got highlighted here, and you can find examples elsewhere, too, where it talks about Septimius sets his little acme above the Syrians or the Britons, and faithful Acme makes Septimius her one darling in desire. What we mean by setting Acme above the Syrians and the Britons, this is before Britannia, the British islands, were conquered. Uh, this is, I think, also before Caesar's skirmishes in the 50s on Britannia's border. Uh, Syria, too, is not officially conquered by Rome yet. So these are two territories that are on Rome's hit list. And by saying that Septimius likes his Greek girlfriend better than he likes the Syrians or the Britons, means that 
he'd rather make love than war, right? That he would rather rather spend time with his Greek girlfriend than he would with the Syrians or the Britons. And this is both a pro-peace message, but also a very subversive thing for Romans who are now deeply invested in the idea that a good Roman man marries a Roman woman and they make Roman babies and conquer foreign provinces. Septimius is opting out of that. Similarly, you have Acme being portrayed not as an enslaved object who's being lusted over or a foreign person to be abused, but she's faithful, she's fixated, she's an active participant in this love story. And not just that, but personified love, um, the word amor in Latin is used both for love, love, the, the emotion, um, romantic attraction, but it's also a god, the god Amor, also called the god Cupid, like, uh, you know, the little baby with the bow and arrow, that, that Cupid, only he's an adolescent character in Greco-Roman mythology. So as he's talking, Amor, the god of love, sneezes to the right and the left. Sneezing in Greco-Roman religion was considered an auspicious thing. That's why there's no word for bless you, Gesundheit, in Latin. Rather, when somebody sneezed, they thought, oh, it's an omen, the gods are thinking of you. And if you sneeze on the right side, that's a particularly good omen. So a Roman would be like, sneeze right. And that's how they dealt with sneezing. But here, when Amor, the god of attraction and romance, is sneezing to the left and the right in approbation, that's an omen saying that the gods are approving of this relationship between a Roman and a non-Roman that's leading the Roman to not go out and conquer things. In other words, this is saying that not only is this relationship a legit relationship, but it falls within the rules of pietas. The gods approve. The gods want you to stay home and have a girlfriend and not go out and conquer stuff. And this is a really revolutionary thing to say in poetry in the first century, right? Where the only people Romans aren't conquering as much as other Romans are everybody else. Rome's in the middle of a massive expansionistic period that's causing deep inequalities at home and abroad. So I'm going to move to the next bit of this poem here to finish my remarks. Oh, no, never mind. That's all I had to say about Septimius and Acme. Okay, now we're going to talk about another one of Catullus's poems. Here, a warning to his friend Aurelius. The titles, by the way, aren't ancient. These are Roman commentators' ideas about what's going on here. In this one, he's writing to his friend, asking his friend not to bang his boyfriend. Uh, this is a boyfriend whose name is Juventius, which just means young man, adolescent man. Um, he, like Lesbia, is a literary character that Catullus invents that may or may not be a real person. And this is following some of the rules that we outlined for Roman sexuality. Uh, Juventius, his very name implies that he's a younger man. The way that Catullus is talking to Aurelius, it implies that Juventius doesn't have a lot of choice about who he's dating. He's just this pawn in this game of uh, who gets to penetrate whom this week. So some of this is normative, but some of it is not so much. Uh, in the highlighted bits uh, are just a couple of the places where Catullus is messing with norms and expectations. So he says to his friend Aurelius, if you've ever, ever had a desire in your mind that you've pursued chastely and purely, keep this boy of mine modestly safe. Now, what's going on here that is transgressive is not that Catullus is handing his boy toy over to his friend Aurelius, but he's using the language of chastity, modesty, purity, this language that's used for upper class people about upper class people, especially upper class women. And he's applying it to this less powerful adolescent boy who's being trafficked by Catullus and Catullus is presumably giving him to Aurelius to babysit while he's off doing something else I mean, who knows what. He goes on to say in the, the next bit that I've highlighted, 
if the tempests of mind, mad passion impel you to, to too much sin, you wretch, so that you fill my boy's head with deceptions, then let that misery and evil fate be yours, of him who, with feet dragged apart, an open door, radishes, and mullets pass through. Um, this bit is going to require some explanation. This is more of a classical Athenian law thing than a Roman law thing. But in classical Athenian law, if you are found to be guilty of sexual misconduct, um, rape, adultery with someone else's wife, or having sex with a young man of protected status, the way they would punish you for that is they would take a radish, a mullet is kind of a fish with rough scales on it, and then they would uh, shove that up your rectum which is, I'm told, painful. Um, please don't try that. I don't want to know, don't want to see. And so that's the end of this poem here. And part of what's funny from a Roman point of view is that he starts with all of this. I'm your friend, you're my friend. I trust you, so I'm trusting you with my boy. Keep him chaste, keep him modest. But if your sexual attraction gets out of control, well then, may you have a radish tossed up your butt. It's um, humorous in the same way that the um, litter bearer poem, the, the Iramator Praetor poem, number 10, is humorous in that the poem is about Catullus's insecurity, right? Catullus isn't sure that his lover is going to remain faithful. He's not sure that his friend isn't going to cheat on him with his boyfriend, and he expresses that insecurity in a way that's hostile and overcompensating hostile in a way that you're only hostile if you have something to be afraid of. It's this um, overcompensating aggression. And it's the same kind of aggression that we get in modern music today, right? Music where um, one rapper will warn you not to play with their girlfriend because if you do so, they're going to punish you in creative ways. But the point of the poem or song or art piece is not um, to warn you that the rapper is going to actually kill you, but it's a performance of insecurity that helps both the performer and the audience to come to terms with the real worry and insecurity that comes from having a romantic relationship with someone who can choose to have a relationship with somebody else to a point. Um, in this case, though, the choice is the best friends, not really the uh, young man's. But this also gives you an idea of how homoerotic dynamics play out in Roman poetry, where they're perfectly fine talking about this relationship because it's still following a lot of the rules. The passive partner is the younger partner with less political power, and conflicts around this relationship are conceived of as conflicts between two upper class Romans, not the upper class Roman and the lover with free will. So now we need to talk about the scripta puella. This is an idea from literary criticism that's useful when we look at Catullus's poems written to Lesbia and indeed to all of his lovers. And that is the way in which ancient poets, modern poets do this too, where you have a male author who puts words and actions into a female character's mouth. And it can be really tempting to forget that these lines were written by a male author. We ran into this a little bit in Plautus. Remember when Phoenicium writes her letter and we're not sure if first Phoenicium is really talking or if she's being made to write this letter or if her pimp is writing it for her. But then also, Phoenicium is being written by a male playwright, in all probability, Plotus is male. And because of this, 
she's not a female character written by a woman, so she's what a male person in this society is imagining a female person is like. And this is something that any fiction writer does. In order to put people in our stories that are not like ourselves, we have to imagine what somebody unlike ourselves will say. And this leads to some problems, yes? Because you're not always going to get it right when you're writing about something, or rather somebody who is not like you, whether it's somebody who's not from your socioeconomic class, uh, whether it's somebody who isn't your gender, uh, somebody who isn't your race, there are going to be things that feel weird and off. Now, in this particular poem, Catullus is dealing with a situation in which his married lover, a reoccurring character, Lesbia, we talked about her earlier, um, we find out that she's got a husband and that Catullus is her side boy. And this is important because adultery is a relationship that's highly stigmatized. So by admitting that he's in an adultery, Catullus is admitting to uh, what is not a crime in the first century BCE, but is going to be a crime very, very soon, and is certainly deeply stigmatized. But then also, the way that he imagines um, Lesbia's character changing and evolving tells us a lot about what he's projecting onto this relationship and the sorts of insecurities that come out in it. In this one, he's talking about his girlfriend saying bad things about him to her husband, and he's talking now to that husband. So here, Catullus is in dialogue with the other powerful man in this relationship, the man that he is directly responsible for wronging in the legal sense by boning his wife. And he says, mule, uh, th which is the insult in Latin, by the way, mule, it's written exactly the same way, and it means like donkey, ass, idiot. Mule, don't you see? If she forgot and was silent about me, that would be right. But now since she moans and abuses, not only she remembers, but something more serious, she's angry. That is, she's inflamed, and so she speaks. What's going on here is a couple of layers of insecure Catullus. We're imagining a scene where he's watching his girlfriend and her husband talking about him. And when she's talking to her husband, she's like, oh my God, Catullus is such a loser. He didn't get anything in Bithynia. He lies about his military service. He is just the worst and I hate him, I hate him, I hate him. And then Catullus is having to deal with that, right? Hearing his girlfriend say horrible things about him to the man she's married to. And the way he deals with this is like, oh, she's just doing it as a cover up. She doesn't really mean it. And then he takes it to this imagined conversation with her husband where he's like, look, if she didn't talk about me, that would mean she doesn't care. But she's talking about me. And so that means that she really loves me. Uh huh. Now, if this logic gives you some pause, then you've gotten the point of the poem. That is, Catullus is aware that he's forming a relationship with a woman who's already cheating on her husband. This is not a secure relationship from which to make a, a lasting life bond. Not necessarily a deal breaker, but it's not ideal. And he's also in a place where he has no right to complain about what she does with herself because he's not her spouse. And this means that his power to be angry with her and force change is ephemeral and kind of meaningless. So he has to deal with his insecurity by explaining to herself or himself rather, why it's okay that his girlfriend is talking shit about him to her husband's face. But I don't think either Catullus or his audience is convinced. And he's also doing something kind of naughty by not just admitting to adultery, but taking like, getting on a high horse as he's committing adultery about like, oh my goodness, the woman I'm cheating with is a cheater. That's meant to be funny for ancient people, and I think the humor still holds today as well. 
So here's another poem about the same relationship that I've excerpted a little bit, um, in which Catullus is giving himself a pep talk. The inevitable has happened. Lesbia has dumped Catullus, and Catullus now has to figure out how to cope. So he gives himself this pep talk. I'm not going to read the whole thing for you, but he tells himself repeatedly, buck up, be hard, be strong, don't cry. You need to be indifferent. What he's doing is he's saying to himself the things that his society says to men. He's saying, look, you shouldn't care about this. This is just an affair anyway. Like you have no right to be upset by this. So you just need to stop caring, put on your game face, be a man, man up and be firm, be okay. And the number of times he has to repeat this pep talk to himself should show us how unconvincing this pep talk is. Just telling yourself to um, firm up and be strong in the face of a breakup does not make you stop being heartbroken in a breakup. Catullus knows this as does anybody who's ever been broken up with. A really interesting bit is the section I've highlighted in yellow where he he talks to her. She's not in the room. He's just talking to the concept of her. And she says, woe be unto you, wicked girl. What life is left for you? Who will submit to you now? Who will see your beauty? Who will now love you? Whose will they say you will be? Who will you kiss? Whose lips will you bite? The idea here is that, oh, you're going to be sorry you dumped me. Nobody's ever going to date you again. You're going to be totally undateable because you dumped Catullus. Who's going to kiss you? Who's going to cuddle you? You're going to be really lonely eventually. But me? No, I'm not letting you back. I'm not taking you back. I am firm. I am Catullus. I am untouched, is the thing he's doing here. This is a strategy that I have seen fairly recently in the news where, um, prominent people, mostly men, dealing with um, a woman who has displeased them in some way will be like, ha ha, well, nobody's gonna date you, will they? Ha ha. <sighs> it's, it's just not a good look. But it's also a very old, not good look. Now on to another poem. This one Catullus is writing to his friend Caelius Rufus, and this is an actual name of an actual guy in the late Republic. That guy I was mentioning earlier, who took Clodia to court, or rather Clodia took him to court for poisoning her, and then he gets uh, acquitted in the trial. This is that Caelius Rufus. So this is another one of these poems that uh, lesbia equals Clodia theorists point to. But this is interesting in its own right, even if Lesbia is just an invented person. So Catullus says, Oh, Caelius, our Lesbia, that Lesbia, that Lesbia. Catullus alone loved more than himself and all his own. Now at the crossroads and down alleyways jerks off the brave sons of Remus. There was an earlier poem, I don't think I had you read, where Rufus starts dating Lesbia, and then Catullus writes him a what the hell bro poem, where he's like, oh my gosh, dude, no, don't date her, I dumped her, you can't like date your best friend's ex. And apparently Caelius was like, YOLO, did it anyway, and then Lesbia dumps him too. So now Catullus writes his bro and is like, yeah, our Lesbia. Man, she, she's just having sex with everybody in the alleys. Now, this is not evidence that anybody was having sex with anybody in an alley. Rather, this is um, bonding over mutual sour grapes. But it's groundbreaking because this is a poem where two men are bonding over being humiliated in love. Like the, the rules of Roman masculinity are that a complete perfect Roman man does not get cheated on. He does not get left. He does not get dumped. He is in control of his women folk at all times, gosh darn it. And if he is not, he is a really bad Roman man. 
in this poem, Catullus is not just being frank that, yeah, I got dumped, but he's also bonding with his friend who was dumped by the same person and mutually commiserating over the fact that she's off having sex with whoever the heck. This is an insult to Lesbia, yes, but it's also bonding over this moment where you admit that you have failed to live up to the unreasonable gender standard of your culture. And for this reason, I have some fondness for this poem, even though it's a more than a little bit sexist and judgy. It's a moment where Catullus is reaching out into the void and saying, yeah, these masculinity standards are a little unreasonable. You having trouble with them too? Let's bond. And for that, pat on the back, good job. A, a note about glubit for those of you who are keeping score and learning Latin cuss words. Glubit means to strip the bark off of a stick. And it's an idiom for um, giving somebody a hand job. I'm not gonna explain why, I'm sure you can figure that out. Now on to dismantling pietas. This one is addressed to Lesbia, who we know from other poems is Catullus's affair girlfriend, right? She's married to somebody else. They're not supposed to be together. And he is writing to her to express his displeasure with her dumping of him and her uh, new boyfriends by saying, look, back when we were together, I didn't just treat you like anybody treats their girlfriend, right? You weren't just a girlfriend to me. This wasn't like an affair, even though it was technically an affair. It wasn't really an affair. I loved you like a father loves his children and his family, which sounds creepy to us, but to Romans, it's not. It's saying that I loved you as if you were part of my familia, even though you can never be unless we get married in a super conservative way. So equating your partner in an extramarital affair to pietas is very subversive and very naughty. But then he uses this to go on and say, look, you dumped me, you cheated. I still feel sexual desire for you. Like, in fact, I feel more sexual desire for you for some reason. But even though I'm hot for you more, I just... I don't love you as much. I don't love you the same way I, um, I love you like a lover, but I like you less. And this is meant to be a burn, right? The idea is that uh, now that you have cheated on me with somebody else, as opposed to cheating on your husband, you're no longer worthy of my pietas. But part of what we as a Roman audience are meant to get out of this is that Catullus is holding an extramarital affair of passion to the same standards of fidelity as the most conservative Roman marriage. He is effectively saying that the partnerships we make, not because of family and obligation, but because of attraction and love and multifarious passion, are legitimate and real and worthy of respect. So much so that when they are violated, we feel it the same as if we had been cheated on in a marriage. And that is the revolutionary thing here, is that he is arguing for the validity of emotions and the validity of love as a basis for a partnership in a marriage even though it hasn't worked out great for him. So it's also reinforcing the idea that you can't start a family with an affair. It's complicating the Roman narrative that you marry people for the good of your family and then you make yourself love them because of expectations and norms and that this is a perfectly emotionally satisfying way to build a family. I think a lot of us would object, right? And we live in a culture where we think of marriage as something that's built on this kind of mutual consent and contract and attraction and um, physical desire in some way. I mean, 
not always, not everyone who does the romantic attraction thing also does the sexual attraction thing, but at the very least, this consent model of marriage making is a view of marriage that we now have enshrined in law and consider to be normative, but it wasn't for a lot of history. However, just because it wasn't normative doesn't mean that people weren't doing it. Throughout history, we find people making partnerships out of love in the face of societal expectations, norms, legal barriers. And this gives me hope in dark times. People haven't changed. People still want to love and be loved. They want to build relationships and families based on that love. And this doesn't make us weird and unusual. But what's really nifty about the world we've built for ourselves is we've made it more possible, more probable. And that makes me happy. I hope it makes you happy, too. On to our next poem. Ah, this one. Arguably the most famous thing Catullus ever wrote. Uh, very, very short. Uh, some people have called this a speech in its shortest form. There's a mission statement, a thesis, there's a rebuttal question, there's a punch back to the rebuttal, and then there's a summary and conclusion. Odatamo quad ad faciam fortasa requiris. Nescio, sed fieri sentiet excrucior. So the idea here is that, as Catellus said in his last poem, yeah, that I'm feeling hatred and love at the same time. And that's weird, right? Like, I tell you that and that sounds nuts. And if you ask me to explain how this is possible, how I can hate and love the same person at once, I don't have any idea, but it's happening and it's torture. I think part of what's made this such a famous poem is that it's pretty relatable, yeah? Even in the most stable relationship, there are moments where you hate the love of your life and you also love the love of your life at the same time you hate them and it's super unpleasant and uncomfortable especially if say you're locked in a house because of social distancing with them for weeks and weeks on end and a toddler use it in good health i hope this makes you feel validated and supported wherever you are one last one This is Catullus's poem 101, and this is my favorite poem in the Latin language ever. It's a meditation on something that happens during Catullus's time in Bithynia. So the same time he complains about having his uh, boss screwing him over and not giving him kickbacks. He was going to a country where his brother had served before. We don't know the circumstances under which Catullus's brother died. It's probably an older brother. And it's kind of irrelevant whether he died of natural causes or not, because he died in a foreign land. And before proper preservation techniques, if you died while you were overseas, you would be buried in the spot where you died. And then if you're family needed to come and give you rights, they'd have to travel to do it. And not everybody could. And remember, we're in the crisis of the late Republic right now. We're midway through a century of civil and foreign war that takes out large swathes of the Roman upper class, including Catullus's family. Catullus's brother is one of many who leaves to go into foreign service, never comes home, and his family can't put his body into the family grave. They can't mourn them with the family rights. That person's body is gone. So when Catullus is sent to the same province, one of the things he does is he offers his offerings to the shades of his dead brother, which is an important part of how ancient people thought of death. Without these offerings, the soul of the the dead person would have a hard time getting into the house of Hades. They may wander the earth for years afterwards, up to a century. This is how ghosts happen. Um, these ghosts could often be used in necromancy by magic users. So your dead people were also vulnerable until they were properly buried. So it's very important to Catullus that he get to do this. The reason why it's such a difficult and broken experience for him 
is that his culture, his home country, Rome, has invested in these foreign wars and foreign governorships that have create a, created a spike in Romans dying overseas. So this isn't just about Catullus's brother. This is about everybody's brother who dies abroad and never gets to come home. And Catullus leans into what's missing from this ceremony. If his brother had died at home, there would have been a funeral procession. Actors would have worn the death masks of their dead ancestors, welcoming their newest member into the family of the dead. His brother then would have been immortalized in the family's front hallway and respected every year in the parentalia. The dead were still with you in Rome to a large extent, but because he died in Bithynia, he didn't get his rights in a timely fashion, and those rights were very scaled back. They're just some small funeral offerings, um, brothers' tears on top of them, and just a single person at a funeral. Like, this was tiny. This, this was nothing, and it's all that Catullus has to give. And it ends uh, with, oh, sorry. This one chokes me up a lot. It ends with, uh, to me, one of the most heartbreaking lines in Roman poetry, where he says, for eternity, awe, hello, atque wale, and goodbye, because he's only just gotten there. He's only just seen his brother, but his brother's already dead. At the middle of the poem, he says, I'm here, I'm here, I'm finally here, and the only thing I have to speak to is your dead ashes ashes that can't talk back to me. And now I've realized, now that I'm here in the presence of your buried body, that what I'm missing isn't your body, it's you. This you that I will never get back. This you that's died in a foreign country that I don't even like, fighting for riches that I'm not even going to get. You, my brother, have been the sacrifice for our country's wars of aggression, for our expansion, for the wealth that's going to fill the pockets of the elite. And now that I'm here, I've realized that I never get to see you again. And that's the price of empire. So I'm going to take you out with uh, this poem in Latin, if you'll indulge me. Multas per gentes et multa per aequora vectus, Ad venias miseras frater ad inferias. Ut te postre modonare munere mortis, et mut ne qui qual loquerer cinerem. Quando quidem, fortuna mihi, te tops to lit ipsum. Heu, miser indigne, frater ad empte mihi. Nunc, tamen, interiaic, prisco. Quae more parentum tradit sunt tristi munrad inferias. Acipe fraterno multum manantia fletu. At quin perpetuum frater? Au atque vale.